Hi all, I have another interesting example from Jabava to show you today. This is against Li Quang Liam, one of the top Vietnamese players in the world and who has been in the top 100 for many years now. Let's have a look. So Jabava playing white. This is in the World Rapid Championship of 2017. D4, knight f6, and now this novel looking move, knight c3. It has to be said, by the way, this blockage of the C-pawn can occur from a variety of 1-E4 openings. Uh, for example, in the center counter, E4, D5 taking queen takes, we'd often play knight C3 blocking the C-pawn. Or in the French defense, the winnower instead of the tarash, we often play knight C3 and allow a, a bishop B4. But the pawn's often on E4 there. So uh, the case with the pawn hasn't played to E4, obviously, that those are interesting uh, and distinctly different. But blocking the C-pawn is not like a new idea. D5, bishop f4, e6. Now, this is why I found this game kind of interesting, because on previous analysis, if you've been following the series so far, uh, I did mention knight b5 isn't usually uh, considered that dangerous, uh, that, that dangerous here, because black can play uh, knight a6 now, and has the possibility of playing c6 to evict this knight back. But this is what was played in this game. Uh, so the knight is inconvenienced, it's decentralized on a6, but without white having played e4, isn't this pin going to be painful if this knight has to be kicked back to c3? If it's kicked back to c3, then bishop b4, surely. We see in this game e3, this knight's kicked back to c3. But strangely, uh, Lei Kuang, uh, Liam didn't play bishop b4. Perhaps he was concerned about bishop takes a6 and didn't fancy structural damage, even if uh, white has to give up that light square bishop. He actually played knight c7. And this is a, a plausibly sensible move in some respects. Uh, the slight downside is this knight, which has gone to c7, is not really influencing the e5 square. If it had gone naturally, more naturally to d7, it would have influenced the e5 square. And there's a classic motto, I believe, from Tartakoa, that if you establish a knight on e5, the attack often plays itself. And so, yeah, this is really interesting. Is e5 an issue here? especially at this time limit uh, of chess, rapid chess, is this quite dangerous, this e5 or lack of control from black? On bishop b4 instead, as an example, bishop d3 to try and dissuade knight e4, uh, this way of playing uh, things, it seems as though white might have uh, a reasonable position. For example, bishop e5, this, even if black plays energetically, White might be able to use the fact that black's castles with the king on g8 and play a move like this, f4. This is just one example and get, you know, some prospects there. Uh, or even in in this case, uh, you know, dropping back the bishop to uh, g3. The bishop didn't have to, um, the bishop could have gone to g3 immediately uh, here as well. Uh, sorry, in this, in this line, bishop g3 might be possible as well. Uh, okay, so there's prospects there anyway. Uh, so in, in the game uh, though, bishop b4 wasn't played. So interesting test. On bishop takes a6, just before we uh, depart there actually, bishop takes a6, which might have been the concern. Is it such a big concern? Uh, takes knight ge2. The structural damage uh, inflicted on black might not be that significant. Black can play like this, for example, and make sure that uh, c5 is used as a liberating move, which will kind of liberate that bishop, potentially, if white's not careful. And it looks as though this should be fine for black. Um, there's dynamic imbalances here. It's opposite colored bishops. Black has got that C-file pressure on C2 as well. So it's it's dynamically equal. So anyway, whatever the story behind this, knight C7 was played. We have uh, now knight F3, bishop D6, and now knight E5. So is a knight on E5 really a fantastic thing to have? Black actually just routinely castled. And now uh, Jobava 
starts to play pretty creatively in my view <laughs> uh, Queen f3 it looks like a very nice attack can evolve from this position uh, this very nice Queen f3 looking move of Bishop d3 start targeting maybe uh, soft spots maybe drive that Knight from f6 which is currently defending the soft spot that kind of attacking plan it does seem pretty nice at the moment c5 and white castles queenside c4 so is there an issue of a quick b5 b4 g4 so we have an opposite side castling scenario these are often uh, the context for very very exciting games b5 who's going to win this race g5 this seems to be a critical juncture of the game it seems as though black must try something very dynamic here uh, in fact um, the knight went back black should it seems at least from an engine point of view play knight e4 uh, a gambit a positional gambit of a pawn so for example knight takes e4 uh, if queen g3 then that nice d5 square which has been vacated means that c3 is going to be quite painful for white sometimes or even like this so it's it's dangerous uh, for white this position after knight d5 um if white dares play queen takes e4 accepting the gambit again knight d5 and actually with bishop b7 now this is really uh very dangerous on this whole diagonal you'll see that you see that this rook is also on the skewering line so this kind of thing it may be worth black playing like this with c3 and if knight c6 which is uh, an interesting tactic uh Black's going to be doing fantastically well. In fact, Black might be arriving first with more attacking prospects. Black's actually getting technically a big advantage there. That, you know, vacation of the d5 for the knight is, is a fundamental feature of that pawn sack. Again, yeah, the prospects for Black seem very rosy here. But in the game, we see this passive-looking move, knight f e8, which is compounded here after h4 by Black playing f6. But it actually is a very difficult position. What does black actually do here? Rook b8 runs in straight into knight c6. That knight on e5 is a real pain. Um, on bishop d7, it seems white can just play for g6 pretty soon, uh, smashing through like that. And that's going to be really unpleasant. So for example, this scenario, um, it looks as though the white king can actually get out just in time. And it's Black's King that's going to be uh, smashed after. So these scenarios seem to favour uh, Black here already. Of this Knight e8, these passive Knights really haven't uh, got central influence now. And uh, f6 compounds things now. It opens up this g file. Uh, so g takes this open road to the King. Knight takes f6. On g takes f6, then Bishop h6 is strong. Uh, for example, this check and rook takes g7. Well, otherwise, you know, bishop takes f8 is going to happen, things like that. Um, so, yeah, this is just crushing. Queen h5, rook takes h7 check. Here is an example of crushing continuation. So, um, knight takes f6. So, can Jabava use this g file? He's got this nice knight on e5. The attacking trump cards here. Uh, should delight most attacking players so rook g1 this open road to the king b4 now knight a4 this is a an interesting thing about this knight on c3 although it's a target if it can jump into c5 here black is fundamentally weak on the dark squares with this pawn chain the adjacent dark squares are kind of vulnerable so being able to play knight c5 even at the cost of a pawn is a really dangerous idea in this particular uh, structure uh, fundamentally bishop d7 knight c5 now here black played bishop e8 on bishop takes c5 just to show the dangers of the dark square bishop without the counterpart and especially with black weakening uh, on the dark squares here at uh, this position uh, there's knight takes c4 unveiling actually attack an attack on c7 that's going to be a huge advantage for white uh, so yeah this this is pretty unpleasant what does black actually play here uh, on bishop e8 knight takes c4 again 
yeah because of that pin against the queen this is just horrible uh, this kind of thing is just horrible there's all sorts of tactics here looking at the queen looking at h5 white's well, getting a massive position there so uh passive move again bishop e8 so here uh, we have actually now knight b7 grabbing that dark square bishop and after queen takes d6 uh, a really crushingly logical move here was played i wonder if you can guess if i give you five seconds to pause the video what would you play with white here Okay, rook takes g7 check, yes. King takes was played. If king h8, then knight f7 check exposes that queen to capture. Uh, so yes, this is getting horrendous now. So queen g2 check, uh, bishop g6 was played. On king h8, again, knight g6 check unveils an attack on the queen. So... Um, Bishop g6, knight takes g6, hitting the queen, queen a6, knight e5 check, king h8. And now, if black ever plays rook g8, there's knight f7 checkmate here. White really just wants to put more pressure on g7 and plays a really nice move here. Well, there's another one which is very, very simple. There's two moves which are real killer moves, actually. So 500 points if you can find either from now. If I give you five seconds to pause the video, white play from here. Okay, in the game, bishop takes c4 was played. This clears the way for rook g1 very rapidly and hits the queen and protects a2 as well. So with tempo, very logical. Also, bishop h6. Uh, yeah, if the rook ever moves, just put that on the board. There's knight f7, and that's checkmate. And there's the threat of queen g7 here, and this is uh, hopeless. That just means bishop takes f8, that disconnection there. And uh, yeah, this is all over after queen g5. It's, uh, yeah, there's nothing for black. So um, bishop takes c4, though, hitting the queen with tempo. The queen drops to b7. So if d takes c4, then just piling up on g7 here. Black is pretty defenseless here. The key move would be bishop h6, putting even more pressure on g7. So if queen b7, then queen takes b7. The queen will be hanging there. So that, that's not actually a legal move. And if queen d6, then white can just pile into g7, even with uh, queen g7 here, uh, and get a forced checkmate. So like that. So the knight's covering the f7 escape square there. Uh, less dramatic, actually, is just bishop g7. Yes. So either way, it's all mating like this. Bishop takes mating. Uh, so queen b7. And after bishop h6, black resigns here. So if the rook moves, there's knight f7 checkmate. It's very, very difficult for black uh, to do anything here, in fact. Uh, white can just pile up as well as take the rook. So black actually resigned here. Um, so very, very interesting use of this Jabava system. It seems, yeah, this idea of knight b5 might even be a surprise resource to play it anyway, even when black hasn't played c5. It shows, you know, sometimes I think the issue is, in a practical sense, if players with black are not used to the Jabava system, uh, they're not really tapping into the full upsides. Uh, so say to avoid structural damage, then then e5, you know, as this game shows, can become a big issue because black's, the black knight isn't influencing e5 as, as easily. So anyway, if you want to find out about more of the nuances of this kind of surprise opening to put your opponent on, on their own resources uh, and you can get really great attacking games like this, then check out Kings Crusher TV slash Jabalva and you'll find a free wit, uh, video by Grandmaster Simon Williams Ginger GM so spicy variations and resources also to be found there for free as well as a lot of trainable variations okay thanks so much